there's no necessarily unifying theme of why we picked these houses. It's not that they were all summer houses or all retirement houses or all farmhouses. Um, they were just houses that struck us as houses that people should be aware of. Because of course, we all know the big four, Ohika, Comset, the Vanderbilt Mansion, and Quandra Hall. Those are the big Gold Coast mansions that everybody is familiar with. They're all in public ownership, except Ohika, uh, but it's semi-public because there's a restaurant and a hotel there so you can get inside. The houses we're gonna talk about today are all privately owned. Uh, and we encourage you not to go drive by and gawk at these houses. Um, hopefully the pictures we have here will be enough to uh, wet your appetite, uh, not wet your appetite, satisfy your appetite for the, the history of these buildings. And some we know more about than others, um, but uh, we think that they're all interesting and, and worth hearing about. Now, some uh, are gone, but not forgotten. These are not all the houses that uh, we've lost over the years, but these are some we, we thought were more significant. Um, one that's uh, recently changed hands, it's not there anymore, Plaisance in Centerport, uh, was built in 1926. Um, all that survives is the carriage houses, which you see on the right. The original mansion you see on the left uh, in a historic aerial photograph. It was designed by Delano and Aldrich, the same architects as uh, Ohika Castle. Uh, and it was built for Mary um, de Brabant and her husband Maurice. Mary was the daughter of William Clark, who was a uh, a uh, very, very wealthy man who um, made his money in mining, uh, mostly in copper mining. He also served as a senator from Montana. There was a little bit of a controversy um, that led to the 17th Amendment to the Constitution. Previously, senators were selected by the state legislature. And uh, Clark was very big in Montana politics, and he went around and bribed the legislators to appoint him as the uh, senator from Montana. So that's when they decided to change the constitution to allow for direct election of senators. He eventually was elected and did serve one term uh, in the Senate. And in his defense, he said he never bought a politician who wasn't for sale. Uh, so I guess that makes it okay. Um, there was a proposal, the house was sold and subdivided, the property was subdivided in the 1950s. Here's the brochure uh, for sale of the mansion. Uh, over the years, there were proposals to uh, use the, the mansion as a, a schoolhouse for the Centerport School District. It was found not to be uh, appropriate for that use. There was another proposal to turn it into a nursing home, uh, but the neighbors objected. They didn't want a commercial use in their residential neighborhood. And one of the attorneys for the local civic association complained that when the owners subdivided this property, they maximized their the number of lots uh, by getting some modifications from the zoning code uh, so that they could uh, make as much money as possible. And now they were coming back to maximize the use of the house as a business. As he put it, they had their cake and now they want their ice cream too. Well, they didn't get their ice cream. Uh, the nursing home was not approved. So the owners never paid their taxes. And by 1960, the county uh, seized it for non-payment of taxes and it was uh, demolished uh, soon after that. Um, and the name lives on, but the, there's a new owner in the carriage house, uh, which still exists, and he's very proud to own this piece of uh, local history. And this brochure for, uh, that you see is the, uh, the sales piece. Uh, you'll see something uh, for another house that looks very similar. It seems they had the same marketing firm for all these big old mansions that they could or could not sell. Uh, Toby, are you going to take over from here? On yeah, Caesar? sure. Uh, I'll talk about uh, a couple of well-known names in Huntington whose uh, estates and uh, houses no longer exist. This is a picture of what was called Cedarcliff at the time. It was built, uh, actually it was built before 1875 for Alfred Mulligan. Uh, and uh, Alfred Mulligan was the grandson of Hercules Mulligan of Revolutionary War fame and uh, of course of... Uh, uh, Ha uh, Hamilton. Uh, there's a great song in Hamilton about uh, Hercules Mulligan. Uh, but he, after going through several other owners, including uh, uh, a Belknap and Baldwin, uh, it became uh, August Hecksher's house. Uh, and, and he remodeled his house and it looked, uh, he put fancier details on it. Uh, same ha basic house, however, uh, in 1899. 
he ended up buying uh, the property around him. So he had, he owned all of what is today lower and upper Wincoma. He bought the Thurston uh, farm uh, down in lower Wincoma. Uh, Wincoma. That property, his wife died in 1924 uh, and he lost interest in uh, coming out here because he was so, it was so associated with his wife uh, that he sold the property and it was developed and the houses began being built in Wincoma in 1926. The mansion survived until uh, uh, 1941 when it was destroyed by fire. That happened to be the same uh, year that August Hector died. He had left Huntington and gone to Great Neck, um, where he had built himself uh, a more proper Gold Coast mansion uh, than this one. Okay. Uh, the other uh, house that's very familiar to most uh, of us that lived around here is Ferguson's Castle and Hale site. It was called a monastery. It was inspired by an ancient Italian cloister and a beautiful Spanish castle. And it was completed in 1910 for Ju uh, Julia Ferguson, the heiress to the Armour uh, family fortune. Uh, I think we have a few more slides of it. Uh, here's the inner court with uh, its clock tower uh, uh, showing the, the idea of, uh, of an inner courtyard that is common in, in this kind of architecture. Uh, it was destroyed uh, in 1970. It had gone through a number of uh, different, uh, a couple of different owners anyway. She died, Julia died in 1921. Uh, and then after that, a couple of owners, it fell into disrepair and it was finally demolished in 1970. There were a, a great effort to try to save it, but uh, it, it failed. The gatehouse uh, survives again on East Shore Road, much like it did at the uh, uh, Plaisance. And another uh, estate house that uh, really uh, was one of the first uh, that come out was built uh, called Calmia Park. It was built in Lloyd Harbor. Uh, it was Churchill Camerling's house. Uh, he built it in 1840. And it was later, uh, he died in 19, 1862, and it was later owned by Jenkins Van Schoik. Uh, and his descendants well into the 20th century. Uh, the mansion was torn down in uh, 2008 uh, and replaced with a, a, a modern style mansion. He was uh, 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 a member of Congress from New York City from 1821 to 1839. Uh, and then he was named in the Polk administration, the minister to Russia in 1840 to 1841. Uh, this other uh, lithograph shows the observatory he built on uh, uh, his property, uh, and uh, it was uh, that's no longer survives either. Okay, and I think Robert's going to take over here. Another house that disappeared over the years is Chateau Iber. Uh, it was the home of Charles A. Gould, who made his fortune. He was an accountant from Buffalo. He made his fortune inventing uh, railroad couplers. So he had the Gould uh, Coupler Company. Um, and of course, this is the age of railroads, so that was a very lucrative business for him. This uh, house was designed by John Russell Pope, and it was intended as a hunting lodge. It doesn't really look too much like a hunting lodge. It's got that funny roof in the top. The uh, ridge of that roof is 76 feet high. So it's certainly one of the highest houses, and it was also on one of the highest points of land in Dix Hills. This stood on the west side of Deer Park Road between Caledonia and uh, Wolf Hill Roads. Um, the estate stretched to about uh, a thousand acres. He started buying land around 1904 in the area and was buying for several years and then built this house in uh, 1909. Uh, he died in 1926. The estate was valued at $59,000, which is hard to believe. And by uh, 1954, um, when it was offered for sale, and here's that very similar uh, marketing uh, piece, uh, as we saw earlier, um, it was uh, on the market for $100,000. Uh, got no takers and was eventually demolished in 1954. The 1950s were not a good period for these Gold Coast uh, mansions or Gold Coast white elephants. He did have two gatehouses, uh, one on Caledonia and one on Wolf Hill that survived. Um, this is one of them and you can see it sort of uh, 
echoes the style of the main house. This one was torn down uh, in 2018. Um, it had been extensively altered over the years and uh, was not considered significant enough to have uh, saved it. Another uh, mansion that survived much longer is Burwood. This was the Walter Jennings estate in Cold Spring Harbor, high in a bluff overlooking the harbor, has fantastic views. Um, it was built by Walter Jennings, the uh, chairman of the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey. And if you're familiar with Cold Spring Harbor, there used to be oil tanks uh, down at the base of the hill near uh, this mansion. Those were built by Standard Oil Company of New York. And there's some dispute as to how they came to be. The story is that uh, Walter Jennings started the Beach Club uh, in 1921 and neglected to invite any members of the Jones family to become members. Uh, and so Rosalie Jones arranged to have the rival oil company from New York build the tank oil tank farm right next to his Beach Club to ruin their view and ruined everyone's view for the next 80 years. Now, those tanks, fortunately, are now gone. Uh, the name Burwood comes because Walter Jennings was related to the Burr family, which we talked about last month in, in comic. Uh, I don't remember exactly how the relationship is, but uh, he is a Burr uh, to some extent. Um, he died in 1933. His wife died shortly thereafter, and his son sold the property to the Helen, Helen Keller Institute, which created the Industrial Home for the Blind. Uh, so this was a place where uh, people who had uh, who couldn't see uh, could live and uh, practice different uh, crafts and you know vocations, uh, industrial things. Um, it was closed down in 1985. The house uh, sat vacant. The property was subdivided, and the mansion was torn down in 1993. So this is one of our more recent losses, uh, which is unfortunate. Like many other, other of the Gold Coast uh, mansion owners, Jennings was a, what you might call a gentleman farmer. He had a whole farm complex, and here are some of his cows. Um, many of the original uh, um, millionaires who came out to Long Island bought old farmhouses. Uh, so that's where sort of this tradition of being a farmer out in the country starts and it continued with the Gold Coast mansions. Here is uh, one of his stables uh, designed by uh, Clinton McKenzie, McClintock, Clinton McClintock. Um, and here's another clock tower, Toby likes clock towers, so <laughs> every chance we get we put a clock tower picture in these presentations. So those are the ones that are lost. And we don't want to talk about just the, the ones that are lost because those are very sad to see that they're lost. But there are other historic homes that are still standing, and we call them hidden. Uh, they may be behind hedges, fences, you know, hidden behind an addition, down long driveways, or they're just in plain sight, and you just don't appreciate and realize the story behind them until someone tells you about it. And one of them, which I went too fast here, I don't know if I can get back. Uh-oh. All right, well, there was a nice modern picture of uh, this house, which uh, we call the Rhinelander Mansion. It was often known as the Kane Mansion because that was the name associated with it on the maps from the early 20th century. But it actually dates much earlier to um, 1832 when it was built for a gentleman named Ryan Lander, who was a wealthy doctor from Manhattan who came out to Huntington and became an integral part of the Huntington community. And we always think of the, the sort of the wave of Gold Coast uh, coming out to Long Island sorry, getting a phone call, uh, being in the early 20th century. But it actually in Huntington started in the 1830s um, with Rhinelander and Chamberlain, who we saw earlier. The house went through several different owners over the years. It started with uh, Rhinelander, I'm sorry, 1838, uh, then to White, to Lord, to Alsop, to Kane, who got all the notice, and then Frederick Upjohn, uh, who started, to, some of them called it Interbayan because it was on the hill between um, Huntington Bay and Huntington Harbor. Um, and uh, Upjohn called it the Lindens, and then Thomas Ralston called it High Lindens. Ralston owned a chain of grocery stores uh, called Ralston's. Um, this is a map of the property. You can see here is Huntington Harbor. 
down on the bottom and Bay Avenue, and then the Bay itself is back up this way. Uh, it was last owned, or more, more, most recently owned, by Joseph and Jean Mack, who were operators of the Huntington School of Fine Arts. Uh, here's a picture of Upjohn when he owned it in uh, 1917. There's a couple of cottages on the property that still survive. And Ralston uh, owned one of the early Woody automobiles. Uh, this is a Cantrell Depot car. And of course, Cantrell was a uh, blacksmith who had a uh, shop on Wall Street where he started making these wood bodies for uh, chassis, different manufacturers' chassis. Uh, so this is one of the early Woodies. So the, the wood station wagon was invented here in Huntington. Here is a picture showing the, the old Huntington Yacht Club uh, before it burnt down and the boathouse for High Lindens. These are some interiors of the house when Ralston owned it. Uh, a lot of these old mansions had professional photographers come in and they dusted everything up, put everything away neatly and had some pictures taken. And here's the house uh, over a hundred year period from 1920 to 2020. And you can see it, it's pretty much identical uh, to what it was previously. Uh, they used to have shutters on the windows and uh, I came and visited the house a few years ago and I noticed that the shutters on this window were closed and they were still closed. Now the window's gone, but they were still closed when I went to visit. And he said, that's because it's a bathroom. So the shutters were always closed. I guess they decided to just get rid of the window instead of keeping the shutters closed. Back to you, Toby. Okay, and uh, in keeping with the theme of New Yorkers uh, and wealthy um, individuals coming out to Huntington, finding Huntington the way we all have found Huntington over the years, as a beautiful spot to live. Uh, this is a house that's on Park Avenue. Uh, it's been recently restored uh, to, to look at, this is a present day photo of it. Uh, Rufus Lang, uh, Rufus uh, Langans, Rufus Prime, uh, came out in 1855 and built this house. He actually bought a small house on the property, um, and, and but he built this larger house in 1855. He was the father of Cornelia and Temple Prime, who were two of the greatest benefactors of the town of Huntington. We'll look at that relationship in a bit. Uh, hidden behind this 18 uh, is this 18th century house of Dr. Daniel Wiggins, who practiced from this house in the second half of the 18th century during a small pox outbreak of the town of Huntington. The house uh, is, was described at that time as being on the road to Dix Hills, which of course was Park at, or is Park Avenue. Uh, it's very hard to take a picture of it with all the uh, vegetation around it now, but it's there as an early house hidden behind this 19th century house. Rufus Prime uh, was the son of Nathaniel Prime. Nathaniel Prime at the time or in the early 19th century was considered the fourth, uh, he was a banking uh, magnet and he was considered the fourth wealthiest man in the country at the time. Um, and he started Prime Ward Sands King and Company, which was a banking firm. And he died in 1840. Uh, uh, this was Nathaniel Prime. Uh, Rufus uh, had lost his wife uh, and was very sad about that. And so he came out to Huntington and built that house and he brought with him his uh, daughter Cornelia. Temple followed, uh, he never got married, but uh, was in the banking business himself. And the benefactors of the prime family uh, philanthropy are notable, they're Huntington Hospital, Cornelia Prime, the St. John's uh, Episcopal Church, uh, the Huntington Trade School building, the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial building, which of course Huntington Library uh, originally. Um, oh, did I jump the okay. gun? No, no, that's okay. Well, yeah, I was just going to comment that uh, uh, Cornelia uh, and Roof and, and Temple uh, were uh, made it their permanent home after uh, Rufus had died in 1885. Okay. Another grouping of homes, and there are three homes in very close proximity that all related to the same family, were built, uh, the original house on the left was built for Julius Langenkraus, who uh, uh, was a, uh, a son of a, a German banker who immigrated in the uh, late 19th century 
and uh, was very successful in the banking per business. Julius took over for him, and in 1912 came out to Huntington on, uh, and built this uh, Spanish-style house uh, up overlooking Huntington Harbor. Uh, then in 1926, he built on the same, on a neighboring property anyway, which is known as the castle uh, for Lester Lane Krauss. And then a couple of years after that, uh, he bought a piece of property and built uh, this house down the street, which is on, um, it's not, is it beach? Yeah, I guess it's on beach road. Uh, yes, uh, uh, right just off of Bay Avenue. So they're all in very close proximity. And um, this was built for his, uh, Julius's sister, uh, Elise, in 1927. The land crosses uh, uh, are related this way. Julius I was immigrated to New York in, in 1867, and he founded the firm. And then he, his two sons, took over the firm, uh, and his sister, who built that, he had that house built for him. She married first John Crozier, and but married second in 1928, uh, Joseph Wallace. Um, and he was an artist, and they lived in that, uh, what is known as the Pink uh, Castle uh, down on Beach. And he actually had an art shop on, Wall on New York Avenue, I believe. And then the son, Lester. It, life did not end well for either one of them. Julius uh, was convicted of uh, bank fraud and ended up spending some time in jail. Uh, the fortune was pretty much lost. Uh, and uh, Lester, uh, I think one of them anyway, left a, a penny on the bed uh, stand to say that he, did, he wouldn't die penniless uh, was the story of that. Okay. Oh, this is some more pictures of uh, that estate. The landscaping on the, uh, the Julius Lane Krauss house was done by Roland Van Wahlberg. And if it looks familiar, it should. He was the same landscape architect that did Heckscher Park. And if any of you are familiar with Roland Conklin's Rosemary Farm Amphitheater on, uh, in Lloyd Harbor, he was also uh, the landscape designer of that uh, facility. Uh, you see on the left of Brooklyn Daily in 1890 of the newlyweds, uh, Julius and, and his wife, and then his son, Lester. And the tunnels was built in um, during uh, Prohibition. And uh, there are all sorts of secret tunnels and trap doors to get down to them uh, in that house. And so uh, there's a feeling that it ran as a, a speakeasy uh, during that period of time. Okay, now we're going to move in uh, further east uh, in uh, with the Oaks, which is uh, still standing. Uh, it doesn't look quite like this anymore because it got it's been changed uh, radically over the years. But it was originally built in 1890 by George Shaw. He was a New York businessman who, along with several other New Yorkers, had come out and bought land in Huntington Bay. They formed a company called the Huntington Company, and th it was their plan to. Uh, develop it into a, a big summertime resort. Uh, a lot of that was accomplished. Uh, we uh, talked about Baycrest being built. Uh, it was kind of related in that area as summer homes where people would want to come out and spend the summer. Uh, Hale site, which was the next, uh, as we go east, the next development done by George Taylor, who was also involved in the Huntington Group, building big summer estate homes. Uh, and then, of course, you get to the um, Bay Club area, where uh, had the Beaux Arts Chateau, uh, which in a hotel, the Locust Lodge uh, existed there, and that was about as far as it got. But they had bigger plans on that, uh, and George Shaw built his own home out here. And on the to the right, you see a couple of pictures that still survive <clears throat> of the water tower. The 1902 was the original. Uh, water tower, and then it's been turned into a house in uh, 2016. <clears throat> it was sold in 1904 um, to John Cartilage. This is the back, uh, well, it's the south side. It's actually the front entrance uh, into the house, really. It's into the front foyer there under that uh, little porch area. Uh, and this was during the, uh, the George Shaw uh, period. 
But then it was changed in 1904 and enlarged tremendously. Uh, it takes a while and you almost have to see the two pictures together to see how this, this house uh, morphed into a much larger house. The stylistically it changed a little bit too. Um, and it was owned by John Carlidge who made his money in the uh, linoleum business. Uh, and it's, I think the next slide, uh, Robert. Oops. Oops. <clears throat> Okay, this house uh, was lived in by a descendant of John College till the 1950s. Uh, and, but over the years, it began to be enlarged in some way. If you noticed on the left side, that hip roof was extended out uh, another bay kind of like to uh, be alongside that. Uh, but an awful lot of the, the house on the east side was taken off, in, including the second story over which is now the... Uh, kitchen area uh, and uh, a whole larger part of the house on, uh, uh, that went to the east. So it was diminished in size and then it was sold off uh, as land got sold. This is a 1917 Atlas uh, map showing the property of John no, Carlidge. This I, half? Yeah, go ahead. Why don't you do it? In the uh, lead up to World War I, uh, this is the 1917 map, so it's the World War I period. Uh, some students from Yale decided to start a, a naval air squad. Uh, and this is where they trained. It's really the beginning of the, uh, in some ways, the beginning of the United States Air Force. Um, they trained here uh, up until the war, and then many of them saw service in uh, World War I. Uh, airplanes were, you know, a new invention that the the Navy didn't think much of, they thought they were toys, but these Yale students knew better. Uh, and they took over the Cartledge estate. This is where they bunked and then uh, uh, they trained uh, on seaplanes out over Huntington Bay. And then in the 1925, uh, she, uh, the Cartledge uh, descendant sold off a lot of the land and they developed uh, what is today Huntington Bay Hills. and. Uh, the house still stands uh, amongst the that you can still see the water tower in this uh, uh, thing and of course you see how close uh, Manhattan is it's just over the horizon it talks about the trolley it points out that where the trolley is the trolley uh, at one point uh, when they were talking about making Huntington or all of East Neck into a resort they wanted we're going to somehow bring the trolley up the hill uh, to service, uh, which would be Locust Lodge in, in the uh, wealthy homes up there that exist today. Okay, the next house, uh, we're going to switch over uh, across the harbor, and uh, uh, this is a 1917 atlas, and it shows a number of things that we have talked about and will talk about. Kalmia Park, uh, which we mentioned earlier, was the uh, uh, Miss is the Mrs. Dorothy Kelly uh, place up at the top there. She was the daughter of uh, Jenkins Van Schoik. Uh, and you can see um, that uh, down below there on the mill pond, there's another Van Schoik uh, uh, down there. So he owned a lot of that land. But you'll notice most of the other land around there on this point is owned by either Elizabeth Anderson or Albert Milbank. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, uh, they end up buying uh, the Millbank property, it was a hundred acre farm there, the one with the, uh, the Panfield estate in. That was originally uh, the property of Admiral Hiram Paulding, who was the commandant of the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard during the Civil War. And we're gonna talk about that and bring that in to the story a little bit later on in the talk. Uh, the farmhouses that Elizabeth Anderson's on Elizabeth Anderson's property there was another hundred acre farm. Uh, and that was uh, farmhouses that we've talked about before. We're going to talk about again a little bit. Uh, but it was owned by the farmer James Boughton or Benjamin Boughton first, his father, and is known as Boughton Point uh, and was uh, a, a great 
playground for a lot of the Huntington celebrations over the years in the 19th century. They would use the beaches out there and have Fourth of July celebrations and so forth. And of course, Fountain Road is uh, one of the main roads out there into that property now. And then the Miller's house, which we talked about, uh, if we go back just one more slide there, we had talked on, on an earlier talk about the uh, tide mill in the mill pond there, the Miller's house was down there. Actually, it's uh, the house that's next to the, uh, the mill there where you can see, oh, and, and yeah, that's the, that's the Miller's house. Okay. These are the uh, principles uh, that Elizabeth Anderson, uh, she actually was the first cousin once removed to Albert uh, Milbank. They made their money in uh, uh, Borden's milk, uh, or they were lawyers in the, uh, there's still a Tweed and Milbank, uh, this is still a famous law firm in New York City. Albert Milbank was uh, part of that family. And Elizabeth Anderson was born in Milbank. And as I said, she was the first cousin once removed to Albert. How they, he must have been a special cousin because they were related a lot in the transfer of a lot of that land. And that it was Milbank money, but it came, obviously Elizabeth Anderson was involved with that as well. Albert um, would be upset that you didn't call it Milbank Tweed. Ah, oh, it's Milbank Tweed? Milbank came first. Okay, okay, <laughs> thank you. And uh, why don't you fill uh, people in? The wo woman on the right is Marjorie Milbank, who was Albert's wife. But why don't you, you know something uh, and tell a story about Elizabeth Anderson, Robert? You know, and her background, she, who she married or the hotel? Well, Elizabeth or... Anderson uh, had a lot of money. She became one of the leading philanthropists and certainly one of the leading uh, women philanthropists of her day. Uh, she set up with Albert's legal help, the Milbank uh, Foundation, which still exists and still supports um, uh, I think medical research and medical uh, organizations. She was married to an artist um, and they owned the building that's on 6th Avenue and 40th Street. Uh, which is uh, where the Café des Arts was. Um, and there were artist studios on the upper floors and the café on the bottom floors. The restaurant was run by the Bostonobi brothers, who later came out to start the um, Chateau Beaux Arts in Huntington Bay. They had originally purchased the property that was on the map on Fountain Point, uh, and they were going to build their uh, resort there. But for some reason, they decided uh, Huntington Bay would be a better location. Uh, so Elizabeth Anderson was not only their landlord in New York, but also their financial backer in a lot of these transactions, which is how she came to own the land after they moved over to Huntington Bay. Um, and the, the Millbank money came from the condensed milk uh, canning business oh. started by Elizabeth's father and Albert's grandfather. Okay, next slide. This is an aerial view of uh, Panfield, which was built in 1915 by Albert Milbank. Uh, this was, again, the original property of Hiram Paulding, uh, but you can see uh, it looks, would not look like this today. Uh, the two houses down below, one is the gatehouse that still stands on the left, and then the other was the dairy farm. And again, you see there's a, a lot of farmland there and it was farmed. Uh, so these New Yorkers would come out, they build their mansions, but they would also uh, be interested in, in farming uh, the land and uh, being, as, as Robert mentioned, the gentleman farmer. And up farm. here we have the lighthouse. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the reasons I put this in. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> That was built in, of course, 1912. Next slide. All right, this is the entrance, uh, which looks very much the same today, but these are uh, photographs that come from, our, uh, from the Milbank family uh, that we are fortunate uh, to, to have uh, access to. Um, so these pho photographs date to the period of time where Albert Milbank uh, uh, and Marjorie lived here. Albert Milbank and uh, uh, um, Marshall Field and uh, Timothy Williams, uh, who 
we're going to talk about it in a, in a bit later. Uh, all were instrumental in finding and founding the village of Lloyd Harbor in 1926. And again, these are some of the interior shots. You see on the left, you see the, the, the portraits of both Albert and Marjorie, and it's the grand staircase that goes up on both sides. Uh, he must have been a, a great, either a great hunter or a collection of uh, heads, uh, of deer heads or because they were all over the, the mansion. Next slide. These are a couple of interior photographs from that same period. This is the great room uh, in, with the fireplace. Uh, it was uh, patterned after uh, an, uh, an English estate also called Panfield in Essex, England. Uh, you'll see that's the library building in another head. This is a current photograph or a 19, uh, 2015 photograph. The pool uh, is still there, obviously, in the fountain. Um, and this is what it looks like uh, today. Yes, I'm about to mention that, Susan. <laughs> Uh, it was purchased, uh, it was it left the Milbank family. He dies in 1946 and it leaves the Milbank family for, to a second owner uh, who was in the, uh, I believe the air conditioning uh, business. But then Bernard Castro built it in the early 1950s. Uh, and uh, this is Bernard on the left. He was the third family to own Fanfield. And his daughter, Bernadette Castro, who's shown here as a kind of a famous uh, wealthy debutante, I guess you'd call her, but with the Beatles in the early 1960s, I guess, when they first arrived in New York. It looks like it's that vintage picture. And of course, Bernadette still owns it today, though she is, has moved and is in the process of selling it. Uh, I think it's available if anybody's interested. And of course, this was the logo, and uh, anyone that's my age uh, will remember growing up with this little four-year-old girl showing us how easy it was to open uh, a sofa bed uh, that became known to up uh, as Castro convertibles. There are other brands now, but uh, I always call them Castro convertibles. Who's the girl? The girl is Bernadette. This is uh, Bernadette as a four-year-old. Um, in 1950, in the early 1950s. This is a house uh, that's in that same vicinity. This is the farmhouse, actually, of uh, the on Bowden's Pony. It was the original center of this house uh, was uh, the farmhouse of first uh, War Charles Wartman, who was associated with the mill. He was the husband of Sarah Van White, who uh, whose uh, uh, brother her father started the mill. Um, and brother took it, or a cousin, I guess, took it over. We told that story before. It's, it was enlarged uh, tremendously uh, later in by Roger John Roger Maxwell, and we'll talk about it in a minute. But before we leave that house, um, it was something I was going to mention <laughs> anyway. Uh, it's it, it's really down a long driveway. No one would notice it uh, unless you took the uh, tour to the mill because it's on that puppy's cove. And even then it was very hard to see for years uh, because of all the trees that were covering it. But a new owner has taken it over and uh, they're restoring it and they're restoring it uh, in uh, great fashion. Uh, and they're restoring, of course, the house that grew it grew into. It's no longer the little farmhouse, but in uh, 1880, 1884, it was bought by uh, this gentleman, next slide. Uh, John Rogers Maxwell, who at the time was the uh, vice president of the Long Island Railroad. Now he was, uh, he originally uh, was going to tear down the farmhouse and build uh, a bigger house, but he decided that uh, rather than do that, there was still, there was, it was pre really Gold Coast Mansion time still, he would enlarge the, the house to the house that it is today. He was a world-class sailor and he would bring his uh, yacht, the Shamrock, in and dock off of his uh, estate house. In the 1890s, he built a, a house uh, that still stands today on Bowden Road that became the farmhouse because he owned that 100 acres and he, uh, he had it farmed. Uh, again, you're knowing that same theme of New Yorkers coming out and being gentlemen farmers. He went on to become the president of the Central Railroad Bank of New Jersey and part of Maxwell and Graves, bankers and brokers. 
Uh, he sells the house in 1882. Uh, I'm sorry, he bought in 1882. Uh, and then he sells it in 1894. And in, 18, and in 1898, he built his Gold Coast mansion, which he made named in uh, Glen Cove, which he named Maxwellton. Uh, so this is what we could have had uh, in Bowton Point if, if he had decided to tear down um, the farmhouse when he when he came out to Huntington. Next slide. Okay, I think it? that's you. Oh, staying in uh, Lloyd Harbor, uh, we'll talk about Shorelands. Uh, and I, I think I may have mentioned, if I didn't, I should have mentioned, there are some houses we'll have more to say about and some we'll have less to say about. Uh, and this is one of those lesser to say about houses, although it's a magnificent house and it still stands and I think what really makes it special is that water tower on the left, uh, which was uh, restored a few years ago. It's still there. This is um, just north of Burwood, the Jennings estate. So it's overlooking Cold Spring Harbor, fantastic views again, uh, overlooking the harbor. And it was built by uh, Colonel Timothy Williams. Uh, Timothy Williams was president of the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company uh, during the, the teens. He had uh, been at the company for about uh, 25 years. He started in uh, 1895. He started his career as a reporter for New York newspapers. And he was so, the governor of New York, Governor Hill, uh, was so impressed with his work as a reporter, he uh, made Williams his uh, secretary. And he served under Hill. And uh, I think Fowler was the next governor uh, before he joined the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company. So he made a lot of political connections, um, was very popular as uh, the president of the uh, Rapid Transit Company, which consolidated all the trolleys and subways and other railroad lines in Brooklyn, and eventually expanded into Manhattan and became the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Company, so the BMT. And if those are familiar with the old uh, railroad, the subway uh, system, we had the IRT originally, the BMT competed with the IRT, uh, and then the IMD, the independent line came in and now they're all part of the MTA. So there's a lot of TLAs there, three letter acronyms. Um, uh, he died in uh, 1930 uh, and the house, of course, as I said, still continues in private ownership. The one big mystery about Timothy Williams is why he's a Colonel. If you read any biographical information, there's no indication he ever served in the uh, military. He, uh, he graduated from Cornell. He went to uh, become a newspaper reporter, then worked for the governor, and then worked in rapid transit. I think it's probably uh, an honorary title. I don't think he ever really served. Uh, maybe like Colonel Sanders. I don't know if Colonel Sanders ever served in the Army. Uh, and he's too young for, uh, he's born during the Civil War, and he's too old to have served in the Spanish-American War. So um, I think it's just an honorary title. But that's one of those enduring mysteries that we'll have to figure out. Now we're going to stay in Cold Spring Harbor, uh, just move south along the harbor, and this is Harbor View. Uh, the original house was built around 1824, and it was in the Hewlett family. And the Hewlett's and the Jones families were interrelated, and they intermarried constantly. And if you tried to create a family tree of either the Hewlett's or the Joneses, you'd be very confused because there's a lot of marrying of cousins, Jones marrying Jones, and uh, Hewlett's marrying Hewlett's. Uh, so it gets uh, a little too difficult to follow through. But by um, 1832, Jacob C. Hewlett uh, owned this house. Uh, he was given, it to, given to him by his father. Um, he was a partner in the Cold Spring Harbor Steamboat Dock Company. Uh, which had a steamboat dock up on Shore Road. Um, he was appointed the first surveyor of customs for Cold Spring Harbor in 1848, which is when that uh, post was created. Uh, he worked out of this home, but three years later, he built another house next door, which I'll talk about next uh, in 1851. Um, and this house became the property of his son, Walter R. Hewlett, and Walter uh, raised a company uh, during the Civil War. He was a captain that raised a company of volunteers from uh, the Cold Spring Harbor area. He was wounded and uh, discharged from service in 1862, which is probably when he came back and moved into this uh, house. Uh, he had extensive real estate holdings 
And of course, the, uh, the Hewlett's and Jones family had a lot of money uh, based on their real estate and other industrial ventures. The house is somewhat confusing. Uh, the story is that at some point they raised the house by taking the first floor and putting it up to the second floor and building a new floor underneath it. And Toby and I have gone and checked out the framing and it's, it's really difficult to figure out exactly what they did. Um, but in any event, it's looked pretty much the same for uh, the last 150 years or so. Here's a painting done by Edward Lang in 1881. Um, and it's, you can see why it has the name Harbor View, because this is the view from the front porch out over Cold Spring Harbor with the tall ships uh, waiting at anchor. And here's that view today. It's pretty much the same view, but without the tall ships. And here's the house today. And you can see it pretty much looks the same as it did in that earlier photograph and in the Edward Lang painting. These are additions that were added later on, um, but otherwise the house keeps its, its same uh, profile. And you may notice this does not look so good up here because the house suffered an extensive fire last year, about a week before it was set to be on the uh, house tour for the North Shore Holiday House. Um, and the house uh, had to be completely gutted because of all the fire damage. But fortunately, the owners have plans to rebuild it uh, and reconstruct it um, with some changes that are in keeping with the historic character of the house. So it will survive. Now, there's a historic marker out front that talks about it being the U.S. Customs House um, with Jacob C. Hewlett, who I said was appointed in 1848. He actually retired from that post in 1875. 1879 is when he died, uh, so this information is not completely accurate. And to call it the Customs House, he worked out of his house. It wasn't like it was a business. Uh, he just had a room set aside as an office where he would do uh, his work as a surveyor. But he moved next door in 1851 when he built Owl's Coat. So this is really the customs house uh, for the greater period of time. He was only at Harborview for three years. Um, this eventually was inherited by his son, uh, John uh, D. Hewlett, uh, and it remained in private hands. Um, here we have one of the receipts uh, for the mantle uh, from 1851. I think Toby may be covering up the, the date if you... Mm. Close to that 20th. picture, you'll see 51 in the side there, September 20th, 51. Oh. Um, eventually, the house was owned by the Golden family of Golden Mustard fame. Uh, so they redid some of the mantles in mustard yellow, uh, which the current owners are not happy with, and they want to change and get rid of the mustard yellow mantles. Uh, I think it's an interesting piece of the history of the house, but... If it's not to their taste, it's not to their taste. Uh, before we leave here, I, I will mention a little bit more about um, Harborview. It was eventually inherited by Jacob's daughter, uh, Phoebe Hewlett Willits, uh, who had married in 1906. Her husband died in 1911, so she lived as a widow in that house until she died in 1951. Uh, and she seemed to have been a bit of a character. She was opposed to the creation of the Cold Spring Harbor Whaling Museum even though the Hewlett's and the Joneses were whaling families. That's where they made a lot of their money. Uh, but she was upset because the whaling museum was going to be based around the whale boat that was donated by Robert Cushman Murphy. And it was from the uh, whale ship Daisy, which was from uh, New Brunswick, had no connection to Cold Spring Harbor. So she said, why should we have this foreign boat as the centerpiece of our museum? Us locals, when we want to create a museum, we'll do it ourselves with our own artifacts. She created the Society for the Preservation of Cold Spring Harbor History, which does not seem to have done much of anything, didn't survive. Um, and uh, the Whaling Museum, of course, was established and has gone on to thrive and be a wonderful institution that it is today. Um, her mother, Henrietta Hewlett, hosted Lafayette's great-grandson at Harborview in 1909. I don't know if that means much of anything, but it's a fun little fact that uh, Lafayette's great-grandson came back to town. Now, further up on Cold Spring Harbor, we're going to go back to the idea of old farmhouses becoming, uh, 
you know, homes for millionaires. This is the Henry Titus house. Uh, Henry Titus purchased it in 1797. It remained in the Titus family until the mid 19th century. And then the Mowbray family uh, took over after protracted uh, probate proceedings. But what uh, we really want to talk about is when 1873, Henry DeForest purchased this house. And DeForest um, were associated with the railroads. They had some connection with Cornelius Vanderbilt. Um, and they were wealthy, a very wealthy family, lived on Washington Square in Manhattan. And this was their summer residence. Um, they he bought up hundreds of acres of land stretching from Shore Road on uh, the harbor all the way over to Goose Hill Road on the other side of Cold Spring Harbor. Um, and then in uh, 1898, his son, Robert DeForest, built a Gold Coast mansion up the hill from the old uh, Titus house. And he called it Wawapak, which is the uh, native name for Cold Spring Harbor. And it was meant to be uh, a Long Island summer house that looks like an Adirondack mountain lodge. So it's a little bit of a, a strange mishmash, but it's, it's a wonderful house. It was designed by Grosvenor Atterbury. Here's another view of the entrance court. Um, and this, if you're familiar with the Cold Spring Harbor Library, and to a large extent, this house was the inspiration for the design of the Cold Spring Harbor Library. The house uh, remained in the DeForest family. Priscilla uh, DeForest, who was Robert's uh, granddaughter, married uh, Douglas Williams, so it was sometimes known as the, the Williams Estate. When the family needed money, they would sell off a few acres up the hill and houses would be built. Uh, and eventually, the the property was down to about uh, 38 acres and 32 acres were purchased by the North Shore Land Alliance, the town of Huntington and Suffolk County a few years ago to create a nature preserve at the top of the hill. And six acres down at the bottom uh, were sold to a private individual who's in the process of restoring the house, as you can see in this picture. Uh, he also cut down a lot of trees to open up the view to the harbor, which upset uh, many people. So it looks a lot different than it did a few years ago. And he also took the old barn, which was really falling apart uh, and has converted it into a residence. Uh, a lot of people said they should just tear it down. It was in horrible shape, but his architect convinced him that it could be saved. And uh, now it's a fabulous house and it's, it's a huge house. And to consider that it used to be a barn uh, is pretty remarkable. How did this get there? That's in the wrong place. Uh -oh. Yeah, you you put it. Well, Do let's go backwards. Slide? Hopefully, I'll find the mansion eventually. This is going to, I'm going to talk about the Lawrence Mansion, um, which you may know as Uplands Farm, which is the Nature Conservancy headquarters. Um, getting back to the idea of the gentleman farmer, this was an old uh, farm. Uh, that had been in the, the Jones uh, family at one point, then it was Simonson, and uh, a guy named uh, Evan Lawrence purchased it in uh, the early, uh, about 1909, and built a mansion, but continued the farm. So he built this uh, barn, uh, which still stands today as the uh, headquarters of the Nature Conservancy on Long Island, and the land is still farmed uh, by Cold Spring Harbor Labs. Uh, they do experiments on genetics with uh, corn seeds. And let's see, there we go. Here is the mansion as it is today. I have an earlier picture when it was built. Um, and I don't know why it's out of order, but I will talk about this one instead. Go back um, one. You may, you may find, if you go back a slide. No. No? You no, these walk. are all out of order. I don't know what happened. What did you do with my presentation, Toby? I didn't do it then. <laughs> Um, this is pretty much the house that Lawrence built in uh, 1909. He sold the property in 1920, so he wasn't here very long, but he was here long enough to have the road named after him. So Lawrence Hill Road gets its name from him. The property was purchased by George Nichols, who had married Jane Morgan, the daughter of J.P. Morgan. There was a thought that uh, the house was a gift from J.P. Morgan to his daughter, a wedding gift, but I think it was purchased by uh, Nichols who was from a wealthy family, uh, grew up in uh, uh, Syosset and Laurel Hollow on the other side of the harbor. And a lot of people do call this Uplands Farm, which I think is its official name, 
I grew up in the area and we always called it Nichols Field after George Nichols. Their daughter, Jane Nichols, married Walter Page uh, and uh, Jane Page, as her married name, she donated a lot of the land to the Major Conservancy uh, when, uh, during her lifetime and more when she died. The house uh, has always been in private ownership. It's recently been restored. Uh, one wing of the house was removed at some point, but the current owners uh, put it back. And here's the description from the real estate listing. As you can see, it's a large house, 22,000 square feet, eight bedrooms, 10 full and four half bedroom baths. I've never heard of a building that has more bathrooms than bedrooms, uh, but it's a magnificent house. Uh, it still has this great view overlooking uh, Cold Spring Harbor. And if we find the original photograph somewhere later in this presentation, we'll point it out to you. Uh, now we're gonna go up to Lloyd Neck. Um, this is the map from 1917. And what you can see here is the incorporated land company property. That is basically where CompSet is today. Um, but we're gonna talk about this property over here, William J. Matheson, um, which is the site of a fort built by the British during the American Revolution. And again, it's a, on a high bluff overlooking Cold Spring Harbor and the entrance to Oyster Bay. So it was a wonderful place for a fort to, so the British could see any ships coming into mostly Oyster Bay. I think they were more concerned about Oyster Bay than Cold Spring Harbor, but they could keep an eye on everything. Uh, towards the end of the revolution, the Americans uh, with French help uh, invaded, uh, attacked this fort. Uh, and they attacked from way over here they, the French ships came down from Rhode Island, and the Americans rode over from Connecticut, and they landed here on the eastern shore of the Neck and made their way across the Neck to attack the fort. They weren't expecting the British to have a cannon facing east, uh, and they uh, were quickly routed, uh, so the Americans had to retreat, and it was sort of a, they were not successful uh, in capturing the fort. In 1879, Anne Alden, whose daughter married uh, Dr. Richard Darby, who was related to the Lloyd family of Lloyd Neck, she had this uh, shingle style house built uh, on the site of that old British fort. So the estate was called Fort Hill. Uh, it was designed by McKim, Mead, and Bigelow. It was before White got involved in the firm. It was a, a, a relatively new architectural firm at the time. And um, McKim was probably the ma major architect designing this house. Uh, it stayed this way uh, for only 21 years when William Matheson purchased the property and remodeled it into a brick Tudor uh, building, um, which is what you see in this picture. Uh, Matheson was a chemist and businessman who uh, created uh, methods for synthetic dyes and made a lot of money. Uh, his company, which originally called the Matheson Chem Chemical Company, uh, eventually became the Allied Chemical and Dye Company. Uh, and here's a more modern picture. It's still in private ownership. Uh, the, uh, it has been sold relatively recently, but a few years ago, the owners uh, did an extensive restoration project on this house and also restored the formal gardens, which were designed by uh, Clinton McClintock again. Uh, now we're gonna skip over to the other neck. Toby's gonna talk about Eaton's Neck. Okay, um, these are two maps of Eaton's Neck uh, that uh, one's 1873 on the left. And what you see on there is the name Delaminer uh, mostly. Uh, you, see a, you do see a gardener and you see a Jones and you see a Beacon stock farm, but that's the laminar as well, even though William Crozier was the uh, superintendent of that farm. Uh, and pretty much all of that property is, is again, one ownership. Uh, even when you go to 1917, you'll see the name Robert Robinson almost all over the map. Uh, uh, that is a descendant of the laminar or a, a son-in-law of the laminar. And, uh, so it's still pretty much owned by uh, one family as late as uh, 1917. But, uh, and they're interesting, there are lots of different things to talk about. Uh, about these maps, you'll see uh, the C.H. Jones name there on both of them. Mary Jones is uh, her name. Um, 
And uh, she was uh, a descendant of the gardeners. And we'll, we'll talk about the ownership of the neck in the next slide. Robert? Okay, the history of the ownership of, of Eaton's Neck is uh, it's given the name Eaton because he was granted uh, the land of, of uh, in, eight, in 1646. Uh, he sold it and, and it passed through several hands and then it became locally owned uh, by Baldwin. Baldwin uh, sold the land to, to Bryant. He's one of the ones that settled Northport eventually. Um, and then I guess it's Bryant must have sold the land and to John Sloss, uh, and it became uh, a manor of Eaton, uh, was transferred to John Sloss's grandson, which is John Sloss Hobart. Now, these names uh, all have great uh, significance to the history of Eaton's Neck, but we're just headed in a different direction, so we're not going to talk about that, although John Sloss Hobart uh, was a, a Revolutionary War um, hero. Uh, 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 during the revolution, you know, he fought during the Revolutionary War. Hobart, and of course, is Hobart's Beach, uh, sold it to a Robert Watts, and Watts sells the land in 1792 to John Gardner. And John Gardner is the son of the fifth lord of the manor of Gardner's Island, who was, and he was the last single, totally single owner of Gardner's, of Eaton's Neck, uh, and as early as 1792 uh, is when the Gardner family owns it. And you can see on that map in 1860, they, they, in 1841, the gardeners begin to sell the land outside the family. And the first sale they make is to a William Beebe. And so in 1860, you can see William Beebe's land, but all of the other lands are, uh, and then the Zacassidy land is up on the north, uh, but all the other lands are still owned by descendants of the original John Gardner who bought uh, the land in 1792. Uh, and to appreciate, you know, the two houses that we're, we're getting to, you, you kind of need to know this kind of relationship uh, between what happens to Eaton's Neck and its single ownership as almost as late as 1860. So, next slide. In 1862, took Cornelius Delameter uh, purchases Walnut Neck from William Beebe. Now, Cornelius Delameter was a New York City uh, industrialist who owned the uh, uh, Delameter Iron Works. Uh, and, and he's significant in the history of, uh, of uh, this country because uh, it was his uh, iron works that helped build the uh, monitor in the monitor in the Merrimack. Uh, that was built in the of Brooklyn Navy Yard, and as I mentioned earlier, the commandant of the Brooklyn Navy Yard was uh, Hiram Paulding, who lived over on West Neck. And the story goes that Cornelius Delameter uh, took a boat ride in the 1850s, late 1850s, and he ended up sailing into Northport Harbor and ended up going into Duck's, Duck, uh, Duck Island Harbor, I guess it's called, and he noticed Walnut Neck, and he always thought this would be a great place to own and to build a, a summer house for. So in 1862, he actually purchases Walnut Neck from William Beebe. In 1863, Delaminer buys the Cassidy property, which becomes the Beacon Stock Farm. In 1864, he, he begins in the, in the following years, over the next 20 years or so, he buys up the rest, almost the rest of the uh, neck from the Gardner family. The one land that he can't buy though, and she won't sell, was Mrs. Eliza uh, Gardner Jones, I guess whose daughter may have been Mary Jones. Uh, and she maintained the, or the ownership of West Beach. And again, our friend uh, Edward Lang in this 1871 painting shows the Jones residence overlooking uh, uh, Price's Bay, Price's Bend in Hobart Beach. And on the left, you see the sign. And uh, further out, if you've got good eyes, you can even see the Eaton's Neck Lighthouse out there just to the right of that sailboat, uh, way out there at the end of the point. Um, okay, so what happens with the Delameter family? Next slide. They own uh, the Be Beacon Stock Farm, uh, and the Crozier is, becomes the superintendent of it. Um, and uh, 
And the farmhouse is actually still stands today on Lighthouse Road. Uh, the lighthouse was given uh, by the Gardner family. Uh, the property was given by the Gardner family. Uh, and the lighthouse was built, I think, in 1799. Robert, is that right on that day? 1899. Yeah. And that's where the uh, name Beacon Farm comes from. Name oh, for the Beacon. Yeah, that, I hadn't put that together, but you're <laughs> absolutely right. <laughs> So um, I was wondering why it was called Beacon Farm, uh, but that makes a great deal of sense. The next slide is another, uh, and these are sketches that from Munsell's uh, History of Suffolk County that, again, Edward Lang is thought to may have been the artist, though there's been no proof of that. But he also has another, uh, in that Munsell's uh, History of Suffolk County, the residence of C.H. Delameter, which is on the right, uh, and his daughter, who marries George H. Robinson, who we see all over that 1917 map, is uh, built on the left. And uh, it's the house on the right. Uh, his daughter, uh, another daughter of his, marries uh, uh, a man named Bevan. Uh, Delameter names his, uh, um, his, farm, his house Vernland. And there's an interesting story related to that. That's the, uh, uh, he becomes great friends in New York City. And again, during the Civil War, when the monitor is being built with John Erickson, who is the Swedish uh, inventor who is credited with designing uh, the monitor. And it was built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So you have Erickson, uh, who works with uh, uh, Hiram Paulding, who's the commandant. Uh, and is, a, is the best friend of uh, Cornelius Delameter, and he names his estate after the town that John Erickson grew up in, in Sweden, and that's where the name Ver Vermland comes from. And these photos are courtesy of the Northport Historical Society as well as this one. Um, this is a photograph from 1890. Um, it's later called uh, the Bevan House because of the marriage of his daughter to uh, Laura to uh, Sidney Bevan. Uh, and, um, and then they have uh, a bunch of children as well. And I think the next slide shows the, uh, okay, the, the relationship. Cornelius Delameter married uh, Ruth Oakley Calder, and they have Laura Delameter, uh, who marries Sidney Bevan, who inherits firm land. And uh, he builds firm land, and Cornelius builds in 1864. Another daughter, Sarah Delameter, marries M. George Robinson and builds the second house. It's almost a twin in uh, 1876. Their daughter, the granddaughter of Cornelius, marries Harry Donnell. And she builds uh, an estate on one of those properties in 1903 that's called The Hill. All of the five adult daughters and multiple grandchildren of Cornelius and Ruth Delameter lived on land and in houses in Eaton's Neck. And they were all given names. And so the second house that we're going to look at in Eaton's Neck is The Hill, which still survives. A number of these other houses also survive. Cherry Lawn does not. Uh, this is a picture of the hill from the 1930s, it looks like, from the age of that car. Uh, it still stands today, uh, uh, and the picture of it as it is today is uh, this one. And it's been, it has been restored again back to its original grandeur, and we're lucky that it, it, it survives in this form. I think the next slide is yours. Well, you have more to say about the hill? Uh, you want to say more about the hill, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily want to. Uh, I just said the hill was was restored by the Carr family. Ed Carr wrote a wonderful book on oh, the history of you. Uh, yeah. Eaton Snack called Faded Laurels, which if you're at all interested in, in Eaton Snack, uh, it's a must read. And uh, his family restored the, the hill uh, going back 20, 25 years ago and turned it into a bed and breakfast. Uh, but of course, these days, uh, the B&B business is not what it was. Uh, so it's converted to a strictly um, a private residence. Uh, and skipping down into uh, Northport Harbor, um, this is the Stanley Lowndes house, uh, built 1897. Stanley Lowndes was the son of John Lowndes, who was credited as being the first man to seed oysters 
in Northport Harbor. Oysters were a very, very popular dish. New York City was known for its oysters, uh, so much so that they, they needed to go further afield to harvest oysters. That's why they started to come out to Long Island waters uh, to dig oysters. It, they, some uh, Connecticut uh, oystermen discovered oysters off of um, Eaton's Neck, and that created a, a sort of a like a, a land rush or a, a oyster rush, I guess, some similar to the, the gold rush of 1849. People just rushed out to get to harvest all these oysters and they thought they would exhaust the natural beds. Uh, so people started to seed uh, beds and let the oysters grow for three years um, and then harvest them from the water. So Stanley Lowndes is one of the men who's credited as being uh, an oyster baron. Uh, of Northport. He made a tremendous amount of money with his company that he started in 1892. And then a few years later, he built this house. It's a wonderful house. And right behind it, it's right on Bayview Avenue on the harbor. Uh, he built um, a dock, which is where the oyster boats would come in and unload the oysters. And they would be shipped to New York City for restaurants or up to Connecticut, uh, where they would be canned. Um, and what's interesting about this house is that it is a great survivor. Um, it had been uh, divided into a multifamily residence uh, in later years and just recently it has been restored and placed on the National Register of Historic Places. I think that was uh, last year or the year before. Um, and you have some pictures here from Lowndes' uh, tenure in the house. Um, this is what the interior looked like then and it's pretty much what the interior looks like today. Uh, the owners have done a tremendous job restoring every detail of the inside and then furnishing it uh, in period appropriate pieces. So Stanley Lowndes came back, uh, he would feel right at home. Uh, it would almost be as if nothing had changed since he left uh, the property. Uh, and that's always wonderful to see people who care about these houses uh, to take the effort to restore them. And it's, it's a great thing to tell all these people who you know, see a house that's maybe been divided into a multifamily residence and maybe it's not in great shape. Oh, so nothing can be done. It's lost all its history. It's got to be torn down. This is an example of a house that did have that uh, situation, but did not suffer that fate because the right people found it, uh, bought it, restored it, and did an absolutely terrific job with it. And we're very pleased to see that happen. Um, we're going to jump down to uh, Dix Hills. Uh, we mentioned uh, Chateau Ivor before. But there's not much about um, Dix Hills when we think Gold Coast, even though there were uh, large estates down there. Um, these were not uh, waterfront estates, obviously, but uh, they were mostly more hunting estates or farming. This um, is the Herman Baruch house. Herman Baruch purchased it in 1926, although the house predates his period. There is a story that the house was built by William K. Vanderbilt for his mistress, and that is. Uh, the big uh, rumor behind this house, but nobody's ever really been able to establish if that's true. But if you read a lot of uh, uh, accounts of the history of the area, that's the story you'll read. Um, but nobody's ever been able to prove it. No one ever found any um, evidence that it was the case. And if you talk to people at the Vanderbilt Museum or biographers of William Vanderbilt, they've never heard of it either. They think it's a little crazy. It seems what happened was when the Long Island Motor Parkway was being built by William Vanderbilt's company, they purchased a large estate owned by a gentleman named Reeve uh, and used only 11 acres for the, uh, the roadway. They didn't need the rest of it. So they sold the rest of it to a woman named Daisy Bronson in, uh, I think it was 1910. The deed from the Long Island Motor Parkway Company to Daisy Bronson was signed by William Vanderbilt as president of the company. So people was like, aha, this was a Vanderbilt mansion. It never was. His company owned it, but he had no interest in the house. The house was probably built by Daisy Bronson um, for her own use on land that the Motor Parkway Company had owned. We can find very little information about da Daisy Bronson. Uh, she doesn't appear in the newspapers or in any of the census records. It's almost as if she's a ghost. All we have is this house that she built. There is a Bronson, Willett Bronson, who developed Baycrest in Huntington Bay. Maybe there's a relationship between the two of them, but we haven't been able to establish that. She would be much younger than he was because he's about a generation 
older. Uh, Herman Baruch purchased the house, as I said, in 1926. Uh, he lived here. His brother, uh, Bernard Baruch, was known as an advisor to presidents. And Herman Baruch himself, who, although he was a doctor, uh, got involved a little bit in politics and was ambassador to Portugal and the Netherlands. Um, they sold the property uh, in 1954 to the, I think I have it here, the Sisters of the Good Shepherd. Um, and in 1961, they decided to make this their full-time location. The Sisters of the Good Shepherd were located in Brooklyn, uh, and they purchased this as sort of a summer retreat for, um, they used to call it troubled girls. Uh, if young girls got in trouble with the court in some way, and they had to be, uh, they wouldn't be sent to jail or to juvenile detention, but if they were Catholic, they would be sent to Madonna Heights. Uh, the name comes from a statue of the Madonna that's in the, the living room of this house, supposedly comes from Florence, Herman Baruch's first wife was from Florence and on their honeymoon they went to visit and I apparently got this uh, statue and now the, the property is known as Madonna Heights. It's, the mission has changed but it still is owned by the Sisters of the Good Shepherd and you can see what their, uh, their mission is now. They're, it's an empowering environment uh, for women and young ladies to heal and thrive. Uh, so it's a very active community and sort of tucked away on the southern end of uh, the town of Huntington. Um, now I'm going to skip over to, to West Hills. Uh, in 1931, there was uh, an exhibition uh, in New York City, um, and uh, Al uh, Albert Fryer and uh, his partner designed this prefab house made out of aluminum called the Illuminaire House. This was on display at that fair. Um, and it was supposed to be a way to provide affordable housing. Uh, it's screws together, and if you go inside, there's a lot of little screws on it. And uh, Wallace K. Harrison, who was a young architect, who had started out with McKim, Mead, and White, he was uh, enthralled by this house, and he decided to buy it. He'd recently purchased land in West Hills, and he was going to move this house there and make it his summer house. Uh, so it's easily dismantled. He unbolted the, the pieces reassembled it in West Hills and he lived there and then he started experimenting uh, with circles and making additions to the Illuminaire house and uh, eventually he moved the Illuminaire house down the hill and uh, conducted part of his architectural practice out of the house and his staff would come and stay at the Illuminaire house. Um, he was, he married into a relative of the Rockefellers, which was probably a good move as a young architect. So he was involved in the building of Rockefeller Center in the 1930s, uh, involved with the UN headquarters in the 1940s, and Lincoln Center in the 1960s. So he had a lot of uh, political connections that helped his architectural career. Um, and these are the the rooms that he created as experiments in working with circles. Uh, so you can see he has a large circle and a small circle. I don't know exactly how the Illuminar House connected to this originally before he moved it, but it became an independent house with all these circles. Um, and he uh, lived here and until I think the 19, uh, well, into the 1960s. He sold it to uh, an art dealer. Um, and then she sold it to a doctor. And over the years, it had sort of fallen apart in some ways. There was a lot of water leaks, uh, wasn't necessarily very well maintained, um, even though it's considered one of the great uh, uh, modern uh, icons of Long Island architecture. Uh, uh, Got to be about 15 years ago, uh, a couple purchased it and decided that they would restore it. And they've restored it uh, very very precisely. Uh, they've made some additions, um, but they tried to keep the spirit of the house as much as it was when Wallace K. Harrison uh, lived there. They sort of, their architect, it took them years to find the right architect who would do the right by, do right by the house. He tried to think of what would Wallace K. Harrison do with presented with the problems that they had now. And as you can see, and as I said, uh, circles were the main um, feature of this house. This large living room is 32 feet in diameter and the ceilings are 16 feet tall. Uh, here's a picture. You're going to see that the pool is a circle. 
the paving stones are all circles. These are actually cesspool covers that have been repurposed as uh, patio stones. Uh, here is pretty much the original house going out this way. There was a wing this way. This part is an addition that was recently built and it, it mirrors the large window pane in the circular room, but this is a flat room, so as not to mimic it too closely, uh, but just to be inspired by that look. Inside that large um, living room was a mural by Ferdinand Legere. Lots of artists came and stayed here. Uh, Marc Chagall was here, Ferdinand Legere, when he was escaping World War II, uh, spent time here. Uh, Robert Moses would come out and spend some time here. Um, and this is a, a wonderful piece, which is now in a museum in Germany. It's a mural on canvas. And the recent owners realized that this is a piece that really made that that room with 16 foot ceilings pop. Uh, without that, it was nothing there. So they decided to recreate it as a steel sculpture. Uh, and this is what it looks like today. And they call this piece Stealing Legere. Stealing being a double entendre there. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful piece and a wonderfully uh, restored house. And it shows that even modern houses uh, are in need of restoration at some point. Uh, and uh, this is on the National Register and is very well known uh, you know, nationally and, and perhaps even worldwide. And it's tucked away quietly in West Hills, a house that not a lot of people uh, hear about. The Illuminaire House, um, uh, there was a threat to demolish it back in the 1980s and uh, there was a worldwide effort to save it. It was originally moved to uh, the Central Islip uh, campus of the New York Institute of Technology and then they wanted to get rid of it and now I think it's in Palo Alto, uh, California. It's a shame that we lost it uh, but to its credit Huntington uh, stood up and made sure the house was not destroyed and it was saved and they also made an effort to have the Wallace K. Harrison house itself saved. Uh, when it was on the market they uh, designated it as a local landmark uh, just to make sure that it would not be uh, destroyed. There was a, a studio building, which was another large circle, freestanding circular building, which unfortunately was lost. Uh, people thought it looked like a large oil tank. And I thought I had a picture, but I couldn't find one. So you just have to imagine that uh, circular living room standing by itself. And I think that brings us to the end. And uh, I think as Tracy said, we're happy to take questions. I saw a lot of activity on the chat. Uh, uh, box. So Tracy, would you want to read the questions to us? Yes, I sure will. And I realized that I didn't introduce myself. I'm uh, Tracy Paff Smith and I'm the executive director of the Huntington Historical Society. And we are an organization that was founded in 1903 to preserve and share the history of Huntington for anyone not familiar. All right. Well, thank you so much to Toby and to Robert. That was excellent. I'm going to go. We had a lot of action in the chat box, so I'm not going to be able to read everything, but I will try to get to the, the big questions here. Okay. Uh, someone was asking about the gatehouse, the Ferguson gatehouse. Is it a home? Yes. The Ferguson gatehouse is a home, yes. And wow. it's right. been for sale. I don't know if it's sold or not, but uh, it's, you know, it's a home. Okay, a lot of comments. It is not sold, someone just mentioned. <laughs> it is a rent, it is rented. It is okay. rented, okay. When our powers combine. All right, um, Cheryl asks, what about the speculation that there were tunnels from Ferguson's castle to the bay? uh there were there was certainly a a, a, a a down stairways that got from ferguson's castle now that you're talking about um to the bay to I, the harbor. I, I think she means the harbor. To the harbor there there was a staircase that went down to uh a, a doorway a gated doorway which is still visible there on the wall um by that gatehouse that went to the boathouse because there was a boathouse there as well. Um, 
and uh, or at least went out to the to the to the harbor. But I don't know whether there was a that may be what the story is about a tunnel. Uh, that would have been a way to go from the harbor up to the mansion. So that that may be based on some fact. Yes. There are a lot of stories, unsubstantiated stories of tunnels. Uh, there was a restaurant that stood on the corner of Jericho Turnpike and Round Swamp Road. Um, it was King Wah, and then I think it was Sun Ming. Most recently, it's been demolished. Someone told me there was a tunnel that ran from there to New York Avenue, which is, I don't know how many miles away, but nobody would dig a tunnel that long. So I, you have to take a grain of salt with some of these tunnel stories. Uh, there were some, but probably not as many as people talk about. Right. Okay. Moving on down to DeForest, uh, is that the same DeForest family that influenced the founding of Stanford, Connecticut? Stanford, Connecticut. I don't know about that. Uh, they, they're a very old family. Um, they've been in this country since before there was a country. Um, I don't know their connection to that. I, I should have mentioned that Robert DeForest was uh, president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and was instrumental in establishing the American Wing. And some of the old uh, rooms that are in the American Wing come from Long Island farmhouses. Um, and that's probably due to his uh, influence in starting it. I, I don't know about the connection. There is a connection to Forest Hills. Uh, they didn't build it, but uh, Forest Hills was named in honor of uh, the DeForest family. Okay, thank you. We had someone raise their hand. I'm not sure if you're looking to ask a question, but if you would just type your question into the chat box and we will certainly get to that. Uh, Karen mentioned that John Gardner is her fifth great grandfather. So that's interesting. Okay. Uh, where is the Harrison estate? Uh, it's not visible from the road. It's it's up off of Round Swamp Road. It's hidden. It's hidden. That's why it's in this lecture. It's a hidden house. Okay. A lot of thank yous. Uh, someone says no mention of the Hess estate. No, no. It's lost. That's that a lost estate. We could have included uh, the Bellis Hess estate, uh, which is now uh, Huntington High School and Big Eight Shopping Center and uh, the residential neighborhood in between. Uh, that could have been included, but we didn't want to dwell too much on demolished houses. All right, what criteria is used to designate a home, a landmark or historic site? It has to be something that is significant and that typically means that it's associated with a famous person, a famous event or a uh, its architecture is unique or represents an innovation, either in architecture or engineering, or, or it reflects the broad cultural landscape of the history of the area. Uh, so there's a, a, you know, a variety of criteria, but it has to be something special about it. All right. Um, Bruce is asking the opinion on whether Cow Harbor was from whales or bovines mentioned in 1656 Eastern Purchase. I always thought it was bovines. No opinion. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's bovines there. too, but. Uh, I, I think it, it was more like a cow neck um, in the Manhasset area where it was, right. where they kept the cows in pasture and the, they didn't keep the cows in the harbor, but the, Great Cow Harbor is Northport Harbor, and Little Cow Harbor is Centerport Harbor, and the neck in between may have been a similar cow neck. And I, I credit uh, Toby's wife Beverly with that theory. And, and I like the theory, I think it's a good one. <laughs> well, they had a tendency, you know, that the home lots in the 17th century were uh, in the denser populated areas, and then the fields were kind of open, and they would just drive the cattle in the summertime uh, in Cow Neck Peninsula in Nassau County, of course, uh, they built a gate across and you had, you could have so many cows uh, in, in the thing determining how, well, how much you paid for the gate and things like that. I mean, I think it's interesting that uh, 
green lawn, which everyone has says is old fields is the historic name. It's real historic name that you get from deeds is called East fields. So, I mean, it was the fields where they drove the, the cattle or, or what the, the cows uh, for the summertime. And then the East fields eventually became old fields. I mean, that's where the name comes from. I couldn't start with the name Old Fields. No. Because it was new at one time. <laughs> well, it had to have been. All right. Uh, can you address when property taxes were imposed? Uh, there were always property taxes. Uh, there were assessments uh, on people's property. I, I can't tell when the form that we have today would have been assessed, but uh, people always had to pay to support the local government. And it would have been minuscule because there weren't too many government services way back. Uh, but as the town developed and more things, uh, more services were provided, you'd have to formalize that system of collecting taxes. Okay. It's a good topic to research. Yeah, good question. Um, Evangelina is curious if we have any more photos of Harborview. Uh, historic photos? No, I think uh, they would pretty much look the same. I don't, I'm not aware of any other views than the ones that we had. All right. Catherine asks, you said the 1950s was a bad time for the Gold Coast mansion. So was that due to post-war economic issues? I, I think it was due to uh, the expense of maintaining these large estates. Uh, people weren't interested in, in buying uh, a house that would cost so much. I mean, they, they come from a period where people could afford to have many servants and uh, they could afford the, the heating bills, or a lot of them didn't have heating bills because they were summer houses. So they didn't have to worry about heating these big monstrosities. Um, they just couldn't find a good use for them. And it's, it's strange that now houses are growing in size and getting big again, not that big. Um, and, and people are tearing down still some of these old houses to build houses just as big. And you wish they would just keep the original house. Uh, but I, I think it's just, it was the, the land value was such that people could make a lot more money uh, with several smaller houses on the same piece of property than one big house. Or, or a whole development. I mean, these were big yeah. pieces of property and, and after the war, it was a great demand to build it. It's going to be head by selling it for real estate. Right. And a lot of them, like uh, Plaisance, was subdivided. The main house was left with some land, mm -hmm. but it was left on a couple of acres. And you might have a big house like that. You don't want just two acres. You want the original 87 acre estate, mm -hmm. which was no longer available. So and people Panf interested in that kind of house would move somewhere else, would buy somewhere else. In Panfield's the same way. In other words, that was on a much bigger property. It still stands, but on fewer acres. Okay. Uh, do we have advertisements for the summer cottage communities? Uh, yeah, the, there are uh, prospectus on uh, uh, Huntington, Bay, uh, Huntington Beach uh, that was uh, developed in the late 20s, early 30s, uh, as well as uh, the one we showed about Harbor Hills, that was originally thought of to be somewhat summer cottages, I think. Um, so they're all, as in Huntington Beach, they're all year-round residents now and enlarged greatly. You mean Bay Hills? Bay Hills, I'm sorry. Yeah. Bay Hills, yeah. And, and you have, we have some photographs that they used for uh, Baycrest and Halesite of those summer cottages. And I think some descriptions of those as well. And a lot of these uh, smaller summer colonies like um, Bay Hills or Huntington Beach uh, were intended to be summer residences, but it, it, uh, when the depression hit shortly after they were developed, uh, people decided whether we're gonna live in, in the city uh, and have our summer house or just move everything out to the summer house, which might be a little cheaper. So a lot of them were winterized in that period during, during the depression, because it was cheaper to live out here than to maintain uh, a city. Uh, yeah, and then I, I forget that the, when Hailsight was developed, which is the land that's between uh, 
uh, vineyard and uh, Locust Lane, those were called cottages. They're big houses today. <laughs> They're big houses then, but they were called cottages. And the, some of them were built to just to rent. Uh, and they were given names. There was Silvertop and Halecroft. And we do have prospectus on, on some of those too. And, and Baycrest. Baycrest was built as a, a summer cottages in a sense, the same way the Newport mansions are called cottages. All right, that looks like all the questions. If I happen to miss your question, if you don't mind just putting it in one more time, there was a lot to sort through, but I think that's everything. So thank you so much again, to Robert and Toby. There it is. There it is. Yeah. There <laughs> Somehow at the end. <laughs> I know what happened. I meant to move the black and white picture of the barn to the end, and I moved the house instead. Uh, History solved. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Good to blame Toby. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll see you the next one. If you have any ideas for upcoming topics, please put that in the chat, and we'll see you hopefully soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming.